Good morning, everybody. Well, as Andrea said this morning, it is really strange for me to be here as a guest speaker because this has been my home for more than 30 years. Uh, and uh, in introduction, the elders have just asked me to talk a little bit about the decision for us to, to move on to Alma and the calling that we felt to do that. Before I do that, I just want to make a couple of acknowledgments. It's really hard for Kylie and I to leave WBC. Uh, over those 30 years, so many of you have poured so much into us. As I look out across this room, I see people who have done sound and music and have been in small groups and taught the Bible to me when I was a small, small child. And they were in our small group. And we love all of you. Thank you for the investment that you put into us. This place has been so, so, so good to us. Um, if you haven't had the chance to be at Alma before, um, I thought I would describe the difference between WBC and Wallenstein in this way. During the service, you might see a number pop up on that screen there, and it's going to be like WX7654, some, like something much more secure than my computer password, right? And that's for when there's kids over in the children's program uh, to make sure that they're getting signed in and signed out safely. What a blessing it is to have so many kids here this morning. Um, they've got that at Alma too. When Micah gets checked into the children's program, he's number one. <laughs> and this is the difference between WBC and Alma. And I think this is a, a big piece of the reason why uh, we're going there. But if I'm being honest, uh, I don't know the full reason from God and how does one describe in five minutes something that God has been calling them to? Um, and how does one do it without their notes? This is a problem. Um, if you would turn with me to Acts 16, it's not where we're going to be this morning, but it's, it's going to be helpful in me describing the process of this calling. Um, I heard a message a couple of weeks ago at Alma from Gord Martin, and it was really, really helpful for me in terms of how I would talk about this this morning. He said this, there's, there's three ways that you make a decision about something in life. And you can see all those things in Acts chapter 16 here. There's decisions based on want and reason, right? We're all humans. We have things that we want. There's things we want to do. And um, that's okay, these decisions should be underneath the general guidance of scripture and conscience, but we're allowed to make decisions without feeling like we have the specific instruction of the Spirit of God. Um, you make small decisions this way. Should I sign up to read the Bible for a year? Yes. Should I join a small group? Yes. These things are decisions that you can make with the general guidance of scripture. But you can also make big decisions this way. In Acts 16, we see... Timothy joining Paul's ministry team, and it doesn't say that the Spirit led, it doesn't say that there was an ordain from God, it says that Paul heard the good reports about this young guy, Timothy, and he wanted to bring him along, and so he did. And that's an okay way to make decisions. It's biblical, it's scriptural, um, and we also see that when you're doing this faithfully, God will keep you on the right track. Paul, in this passage, wants to go and preach in Asia, and he keeps trying to do it, but he faces the active resistance of God. If you're trying to make decisions under the will and wisdom of God, he will be faithful to keep you on the right track. God actively resisted this thing that Paul wanted to do, which would have been a good thing, but he didn't allow him to because it wasn't God's plan. Then there's other times when God takes decisions completely out of our hands, right? Paul is imprisoned, and he has all sorts of options. Do I get a lawyer? Do I, uh, you know, just wait this out? You know, is it jailbreak time? What are we doing? And God takes all that decision out of his hand, and the walls start shaking, chains start rattling off, people are getting saved. It's a miracle, right? Sometimes God will take decisions out of our hands because, as we're going to talk about this morning, he's an active God. He's not a passive God. Sometimes God just does things because he will achieve his purpose. Uh, 
But when I think about our decision to move to Drayton and begin attending Alma, it was neither of those things. We didn't just decide that this is something we wanted to do. And we weren't picked up and teleported there by God himself. Uh, it was a third kind of decision, a much more difficult kind of decision. Um, sometimes we have to make decisions without any clarity, but we feel that they're from God. And we see that in this passage as well. Uh, Paul gets a vision, he gets a dream in the night. And in verse 10 it says this, Paul had seen the vision and we got ready to leave at once for Macedonia, concluding, this is the key word in that sentence, that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Paul wasn't convinced and purposeful as he had been at many other times in the book of Acts. He took this vision that he wasn't sure about to his companions and they concluded together that this was from God. When Gord was talking about this, he called these decisions infused with the wind of God. You're not 100% certain, but you feel like God is moving. And he referenced John 3, 8, the wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone who's born of the Spirit. This is the most difficult type of decision because sometimes you're not certain, but you just have to step out in faith. And for Kylie and I, going to move to Drayton and go to Alma, those are kind of one and the same decision for us, um, didn't come in a dream, but a persistent feeling that we had from the Lord. I spoke there a couple of years ago, and we walked out of the church at the same time. We both looked at each other, and we said, did you feel that? And we didn't really know what was happening, but we explored it in prayer. We talked about it with good friends um, and with the leadership here at WBC and we were ready for the resistance of God. We were perhaps even hoping for the resistance of God at times, um, but we found none and so we moved forward in faith uh, and there's been a lot of cool things happening and I'm not going to get into all of that. Um, I hope as we look forward to 2024 that little decision making matrix can be helpful for you. Um, and I think that for me, it kind of forms a prayer that I have for this church, that WBC would be focused on the scriptures, that you're prepared to make those decisions, those general decisions with the guidance and the knowledge of God clear in your heart, even if you're not hearing something specific from the spirit about it. And I'm praying that you'll be sensitive to the leading of God, that when there's decisions infused by the wind, that you would be listening to the wind, that you would have your heart open and attentive to the Spirit of God. And that when there's big, miraculous, wonderful things happening, that you would be ready to participate in them. And you might say, Adam, big, beautiful, wonderful, miraculous things, do they really happen like that anymore? And I would say, yes. I've seen that in my own life, and I've seen that in this church I remember Wallenstein before Wallenstein was all of this. It was a small group of people meeting upstairs in a building that looked nothing like this. And I remember vividly as a young man sitting right over there about where our friend Josh is sitting and just looking out at empty pew after empty pew after empty pew, wondering why did we build such a big building? What is going on here? How is this place ever going to be full? And now, after the movement of God, you have the opposite problem, right? You're parking people in cornfields, there's people in the gym. This is the movement of God. And it's not something small, it's something powerful. But just because the building is full doesn't mean that God is done with you. He has big things that he wants to do in this place. I hope that you're ready for what he has coming for you. And that's what I want to talk about this morning from the book of Micah, our participation in what the Lord is doing. So, the book of Micah is a book that I've spent a lot of time in. I named my kid Micah, so I thought I probably should know something about it, right? And um, it's, it's from the Old Testament. I'll be reading primarily from chapter two. Uh, Micah was a prophet, he was a, a rural prophet. Think about him from being somewhere like Drayton. You know, Micah is hopping in his F-250, jacking it up and driving to Jerusalem. This is, uh, this is where he's from. He's from way out in the sticks. Uh, 
And he is bringing them a message during a really difficult time for the people of Israel. He's bringing them a message really close to the time when the people of Israel are going to be exiled. He served God faithfully for a long time. He served many different kings in Israel and in Judah. There was two separate kingdoms. Um, and his, prob- his public ministry was probably in excess of 25 years, which is a long time for a prophet. Um, the overall theme of Micah's ministry is judgment and forgiveness. He brings the Lord's lawsuit against the people because the people had turned away from God. They had literally nailed shut the doors of the temple. They had kicked the priests out into the street unemployed. They had set up altars in high places. They were sacrificing to gods who were not God. And so Micah declares to them that God is a righteous judge and he is going to scatter them among the nations. They will no longer be in Israel, but he will remove them from this place that they have defiled with their sin. But even though judgment is coming, that's not the end of the story. That God is not just a judge, he's also their shepherd king, who in his faithfulness will gather the people back together. He will protect them and he will forgive them. And though the day of reckoning is at hand, there's a day in the future coming where he will bring these people back to their land and he will also send them a Messiah, a shepherd king, so that they can stay in his flock forever. Now, when I put it that way, it seems a little bit less confusing and chaotic than what we're about to read, okay? But I want you to stick with me and realize that the word of God is for us um, in all times, in all places, and um, yeah, I, I trust that God will use this passage to enrich your heart as he has for me. So let's read Micah chapter two together. We're gonna read the whole passage. Um, and this is what it says. It says, woe to those who plan iniquity, to those who plot evil on their beds. At morning's light, they carry it out because it's in their power to do it. They covet fields and seize them. In houses, they take them. They defraud people of their homes. They rob them of their inheritance. Therefore, the Lord says, I am planning disaster against this people from which you cannot save yourselves. You will no longer walk proudly. It will be a time of calamity. In that day, people will ridicule you. They will taunt you with this mournful song. We are utterly ruined. My people's possession is divided up. He takes it from me. He assigns our fields to traitors. Therefore, you will have no one in the assembly of the Lord to divide the land by lot. Do not prophesy, their prophets say. Do not prophesy about these things. Disgrace will not overtake us. You descendants of Jacob, should it be said, does the Lord become impatient? Does he do such things? Does not my word do good to those whose ways are upright? Lately, my people have risen up like an enemy. You strip off the rich robe from those who pass you by without a care, like men returning from battle. You drive the women of my people from their pleasant homes. You take away my blessing from their children forever. Get up, go away. This is not your resting place because it is defiled. It is ruined beyond all remedy. If a liar and deceiver comes and says, I will prophesy for you plenty of wine and beer, that would be just the prophet for this people. I will surely gather all of you, Jacob. I will surely bring together the remnant of Israel. I'll bring them together like sheep in a pen, like a flock in its pasture. The place will throng with people the one who breaks open the way will go up before them. They will break through the gate and go out of it. Their king will pass through before them, the Lord at their head. So you might be wondering, it's a little somber, a little sober in here at the moment. And I can see this question bouncing around in some of your minds. Adam, didn't Jesus or John or Paul give some sort of a rousing speech that you could have used to cheer us up on New Year's? Of course they did. That's not what I'm reading you this morning. Um, and I wanted to just address that as a piece of the message and say, why not? Why would I pick a passage like this? 
And I think one of the big things for me as I've studied the book of Micah is that this is a passage that's very fitting for our times. You look around and the word that gets tossed around endlessly right now is unprecedented, right? The housing market is unprecedented. The cultural situation is unprecedented. What's happening in school is unprecedented, unprecedented, unprecedented. And it can make us feel like we're kind of treading some new ground here. And like maybe no one really can relate to what we're feeling and what we're experiencing. And maybe scripture is just a little bit outdated because it never talks about the things I'm going through. If you're feeling like that, I'd like to introduce you to the book of Micah because the times before the exile of Israel were really, really interesting. Economically, the country was doing really well. There was this large and wealthy middle class, but the culture was rapidly abandoning the ways of God. There's all sorts of spiritual implications for this, but there was also cultural and social changes that started happening. Right? And these things happened much quicker than anyone could imagine. From that large and wealthy middle class emerged a small group of rich merchants and moneylenders. These rich people soon found out that there was a lot of money to be made in real estate. And so through the policies that they lobbied for and their greed, they cast aside what God had instituted in terms of laws that he had established to preserve property ownership for all people. They made housing unaffordable, unattainable, unreachable for the average family. It says this in Micah 2, 2, we read it. They covet fields and seize them. Houses take them. They defraud people of their homes. They rob them of their inheritance. Now, not only were the rich people doing these things, but they also had politicians at all levels of government who were corrupt. They cared only about themselves and their power. They cared nothing for the people that God had entrusted them to lead. It says right at the beginning, woe to you who plant iniquity, to you who do evil on their beds. At morning's light, they carry it out because it's in their power to do it. These people did whatever they wanted with no apparent consequences. Now, not only were the rich and the politicians corrupt, but they also had religious people who were turning their back on the word of God. They knew what scripture would have them do. They knew what God had given to their forefathers, but they abandoned it to follow the wisdom of the world. They were not only walking away from the truth of God, but they were actively hindering the word of God. They were coming to Micah, and in verse six it says, do not prophesy their prophets say, don't prophesy about these things. Disgrace will not overtake us. Micah was giving them the truth of God, that judgment was coming, and they didn't want to hear it. Does any of this sound at all familiar to you? Do, you? do you see any sort of parallels here happening with what's happening in our day? It does to me. And I think about this, and as I read this book, I see more and more, it feels like 2024. And I don't mean that in like a prophetic sense, like there's an exile and we're all gonna move from Elmira somewhere else. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm saying is that I'm really, really thankful that God gives us scripture that we can relate to. Because these times are hard. And some of the things that we're facing are unreasonable and they're unfair. And it's tough to know what to do about them. But it's really, really good to know that they're not unprecedented. That it's not something that the world hasn't seen before. It's not something that God hasn't guided his people through before. Now, I could stand up here all day and throw rocks at the rich and the politicians and they would probably deserve it. But Micah saves his most cutting, most direct, insightful line for the hearts of the people. He says this, he says, if a liar and a deceiver comes and says, I'll prophesy for you plenty of wine and beer, that would be just the prophet for this people. Now, I don't think that this rebuke is about alcohol. I think it's about distraction. Did the people drink too much? Probably, but that's not what he's talking about. The people didn't wanna hear the word of God. They would rather be endlessly distracted 
And they would perhaps even know that the person who was prophesying to them, the person who was influencing their life, was lying to them. And they would listen to that voice anyway because they would rather be endlessly distracted than face the uncomfortable truth of God. And that is the most 2024 thing I have said this morning. What do we do? We pick up our phones and we endlessly consume things that we know are not true. But we'd rather do that than face the uncomfortable truth of God. We'd rather be endlessly distracted than hear what God has for us. Nobody wants to hear the truth of God, especially if you present it as the truth. And this is a tough place to be, right? How do you deal with a culture where we want to be distracted? We have no appetite for the things of God. Destined for judgment. Well, Micah points us to a hope, a great hope, and his hope is this, that we serve an active God. It says this at the end of that passage. There's all the coming trouble and there's all the coming hardship. But it says in verse 12 and 13, I will surely gather all of you, Jacob. I will surely bring together the remnant of Israel. I will bring them together like sheep in a pen, like a flock in its pasture. The place will throng with people. The one who breaks open the way will go up before them. They will break through the gate and go out. Their king will go before them, the Lord at their head. Now, this is a prophecy, and I'm not an expert in prophecy, so I'm not going to try to dive into this, but we see that God has brought portions of this prophecy to past in returning the people to their land, and there's portions yet to come. The people of God still don't accept his Messiah, but there is coming a day when he will reclaim his place at their head as their one and only true leader. And the thing that I love about it is it just shows how active God is. He says, I will gather you. I will bring them. He's not waiting. He's not making this contingent on something else. There is a coming day when it's not conditional, but the Lord in his strength and his power will restore himself there. And in verse 13, it says this, the one who breaks open the way will go up before us. This is such a beautiful picture of God dealing with his people the way that he did during the Exodus, right? You had this great group of people leaving Egypt and God put himself before them and he led the way. God broke open the way. And that's who God is, right? Our entire Bible is about the God who breaks open the way. Abraham wasn't able to have kids, but he became the father of a great nation. When Israel was trapped in their slavery, Egypt had no intention of letting them go, but God broke open a way. When they were leaving the captivity in Egypt and Pharaoh sent his army to surround the people, God broke open a way straight through the sea, water on either side. Our God breaks open a way. When David was facing down a giant who should have killed him where he stood, instantly, God made the way. When Jonah was running as fast and as far as he could from God, God brought him back from the depths. Our God is the one who makes a way. In the same way that those people needed a way maker, we need a way maker. Right? We need a God who will be faithful to us when we're not faithful to him. We need a God who will reach out to us when we will not reach out to him. Later in his book, Micah gives us more insight into the way maker, into our shepherd king. It says this in Micah chapter 5, But you, Bethlehem, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over all of Israel whose origins are from of old, of ancient times. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely, and then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. The people in Micah's day 
needed Jesus. In the midst of their difficulty and their waywardness, God held out to them the same hope that he holds out to us, a savior named Jesus, whose origins are from of old, but stands ready to welcome us into his flock. He is the way maker. He went before us. He conquered death. He went where we cannot go so that we can follow him. He will go before us. And so I just wanted to give you four things from Micah 2 that can help you in 2024. This is a New Year's message. I should leave you with something. Uh, And the first one is this, a reminder that God sees you and he cares for you. Some of the stuff that's going on in this world is, is terrible. The Lord cared about it then. Micah's primary ministry was to go to the leaders of the people and rebuke them for their sin. If God cared enough to send Micah then to confront the same things we confront now, God cares about it now. And he loves you and he has compassion on you. And it's not fair, the things that you're dealing with out there. And I'm not promising you an immediate change to any of that. I can't do that. But I can promise you this. God has not forgotten you. God has not abandoned you. And do not let the difficulties of this world turn you from God. Let them turn you to God. The second thing is this. It's a reminder that God will not leave evil unpunished. The prophecies of judgment and destruction are not the cool thing that we want to talk about all the time, right? But the destruction that was promised in the book of Micah, it came to pass in his lifetime. God sent Micah to the people of Israel with a message that said, there is coming destruction for you and you cannot escape it. What a difficult message to bring, but he brought it. And he saw this come to pass. He would have watched as the Assyrian Empire took the northern people of Israel, took his hometown, took the city of Samaria, and exiled them. 120 years later, about 100 years after Micah's death, the same thing happened to the southern kingdom of Judah and Jerusalem at the hands of the Babylonians. Micah prophesied both of these things. In our time, it can be really easy to see the wicked prosper and think that nothing's gonna happen. Like that maybe we're missing out on something, maybe we've picked the wrong way. Or we can see the wicked prosper and we can think to ourselves, as is more common now in the church, well maybe there really is no judgment for sin. Maybe there really is no coming judgment. Will God really destroy the wicked as he's promised? Yes. God is a just judge. He is patient with us. He loves us. He doesn't want anyone to perish, but he will return in power and judge the nations. Don't be led astray and think that this judgment isn't coming. It happened throughout scripture and it will happen again. The third reminder is this, that God will accomplish his purposes. I love that about this chapter. I love that about this book. I love that about the prophets in general, right? It's all about what God is doing. And as we get to the new year, so often we're thinking right now about resolutions. I'm gonna do this for my health. I'm gonna do this for my family. I'm gonna do this for my business. And that stuff is all really good. We should be working to improve ourselves. But I think sometimes we think that the work of God happens on our timeline right? Like, it's, it's not a season of work for me right now. It's not a season of this. And, you know, when I've accomplished this goal or when I've met this milestone, then God is, is ready to work in my life. And what I would say to you is this, God is moving right here, right now, and he's not waiting for you. God will accomplish his purposes. God is moving and active. And you see that throughout scripture, that God is doing things, And if you're not participating in it, you're waiting on the sidelines, but God desperately wants you off the sidelines and into the game. Don't deceive yourself that God's purposes wait for you. God waits for no one. Get 
on board with what he's doing. So let me ask you this morning, do you know what God is doing in your hometown? Do you know what God is doing in this church? Do you know what he's doing in this province and in this nation? And if you don't know, you should find out. You should seek that in prayer. You should talk to an elder or a small group leader or a ministry leader, and you should see what God is doing. And if you know what God is doing, then you should get off the sidelines and go and do it with them. God doesn't need you to wait for him. He is going and doing things. And the best way for you to get ready to serve is to go and serve with a mature, established believer who's already participating in what God is doing. Right? Come alongside someone that you trust, someone who follows the way of the way maker and participate in his purpose with them. That will get you ready much quicker than not doing it. Finally, my point is this, that the truth of God brings revival. The message that Micah came to tell the people was a difficult one, right? That they were facing coming destruction. And even the religious people of his day told him to stop prophesying because no one wanted to hear it. But Micah was faithful to the message of God. He didn't turn away like the other leaders. He spoke what God had given him to speak. And you might be wondering, why did the exile happen at two different times? Why was there a northern kingdom that went, and then 120 years later, the southern kingdom went, the kingdom of Judah went? Well, we get the answer to that question in, I believe, the only time in Scripture when Micah is mentioned outside of his own book. It's from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 26. And it says this in verse 18. Micah of Moresheth prophesied in the days of King Hezekiah. And he told all the people of Judah, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Zion will be plowed like a field. Jerusalem will be a heap of rubble. The temple mound in overgrown thickets. Did Hezekiah or Judah or anyone else put him to death? Did not Hezekiah fear the Lord? and seek his favor? Did not the Lord relent so that he would not bring the disaster he pronounced on them? The difficult truth of Micah's message broke through to the heart of a young king and this nation that was facing unprecedented wickedness and destruction soon was facing unprecedented revival. The, tent, the doors of this temple, which were nailed shut, he threw them open. The priests who were out in the street, he put them back to work. The temples and the high places and the sacrificing, he tore them all down. He returned the people of Israel to God, to the law that God had given to Moses. What's my point? Our nation could use just a touch of that. Amen? Amen? The wickedness in our day is no different than it was then, and revival seems equally impossible now, doesn't it? It's tough to imagine a warm reception to our message, but does that stop us from bringing it? Because it didn't stop Micah. Are we faithful to the word of God? Are we bringing his truth to the nations, hoping and praying for a revival? My fear for us is this, that we face resistance, we face opposition, and we throw in the towel. We say, oh, you know, this is, this is the end, and it's, you know, it's getting darker, and it's only getting darker. From the time of Hezekiah and Micah until now, it's almost 3,000 years, and in those 3,000 years, countless times, there have been societies and places with deep, bitter darkness where the light of God has changed it around. Why do we think that we are any different? We should not let our troubles hold us back from the gospel. We should preach the gospel with renewed vigor, with renewed focus, with renewed attention that we might pray for revival in our land because we need it. 
God's truth brings revival. There's nothing we can add. There's nothing we can remove from the message of God to make it more appealing to the nations. We need to bring the message of God to the nations. And the message of God hasn't changed since the days of Micah. That we have a God who is a judge, but who is also our shepherd king. That there is no way for us to come to God, but he is the one who makes a way. In 2024, this is my encouragement to you that you would seek out the purposes of God, see the ways that he is making, and that we would follow him and fall in behind God and serve him faithfully in 2024. That brings me to the end of my message from Micah, and it brings us right into communion. And what an amazing thing that we can pause to do and remember the one who makes a way. His body broken for us, his blood spilled for us. There was no way for us to come to him other than this. And he did it for us. So I'll just ask the ushers to come and I'll pray quickly for this communion. If you know the Lord, please join us together this morning in participating with communion. God, we love you, and we're so thankful that you reveal yourself to us and that you make a way. You are the great God of heaven. Come down for us to shepherd us, to lead us where we don't want to go, to bring us into your family to hold us safe in your hands. God, thank you for your sacrifice. Jesus, thank you for what you did for us. Amen. To close our time together this morning, I just want to give you a couple of words right from the end of the book of Micah, and I'd like to pray a blessing for you. Who is a God like you who pardons sin and forgives the transgression to the remnant of his inheritance. You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. You will be true to Jacob and show mercy to Abraham as you pledged on oath to our fathers in days long ago. Let's pray. God, thank you for this group of people here at Wallenstein. Thank you for the blessing that they have been to me and to my family. And thank you to the blessing that they are to this community. God, I pray that as we move forward into 2024, that you would stir our hearts to be part of what you're doing. We know that you're an active God. We know that you are a God who brings revival to the darkest places. And God, it feels dark right now. We love you, and we're desperate for you. God, I pray that you would bring to this place prosperity, that you would bring people who need to know you. God, that that in this coming year, there would be salvation, that there would be rededication, that there would be baptisms. God, that you would continue moving and stirring in this place as you have. Thankful, thankful, God, I'm so thankful to you for your faithfulness to us. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.